Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This was the message preached by Jesus for nearly two years to the nation of Israel and the Jewish hierarchy. The reactions Jesus received were mixed. The common people were amazed by the authority of his preaching, while the Pharisees and Sadducees were antagonized. The preaching of Jesus was revolutionary and contentious. The Sermon on the Mount exposed the hypocrisy of the burdensome demands imposed on the people by Pharisaic law and the tradition of the elders. The scribes and Pharisees used these traditions to control the people. Remember, he who controls the concept of righteousness controls the people. Jesus was a threat to national security and stability. His Sabbath day violations could destabilize the nation and bring Roman wrath down on them. Jesus had enemies among the religious elite, enemies who sought to murder him. No doubt, the Pharisees and the Sadducees rejected the kingdom message of Jesus because his message did not fit into the doctrines and traditions of the status quo. Should the people follow Jesus, then the power and control exercised by the religious elite would end. Jesus understood that the Sanhedrin wanted his death because they could not control him. It is now the spring of 32 AD. The emphasis of Jesus' ministry changes from offering the kingdom to a rebellious nation to forming the kingdom in his disciples. During these months, Jesus and his disciples traveled mostly in Phoenicia, Ituria, Traconius, and Decapolis. These areas were mostly north of the Sea of Galilee and east of the Jordan River. These regions were generally beyond Pharisee antagonism because they were mostly Gentile colonies. Jesus used these quiet months to etch the kingdom message deep into the hearts of his disciples. The bell has rung, school is now in, the pupils are seated, and the teacher is ready. When we harmonize the Gospels, three levels of commitment are seen in the followers of Jesus. Each level displays a deeper loyalty to Christ. First we see the curious crowds. Multitudes were attracted to Jesus to hear his words and see his works, but no decision was made to obey his doctrine or submit to his person. The curious followers are disciples in name only, and they spend years sitting in churches and never allow Christ's teachings and spirit to change or transform them. Often these Christians are deceived by their religious experience. They only see Christ and his teachings to be their traditional religion. The convinced disciple comes from the ranks of the curious who responds to the teachings of Jesus and learn to love him. They are convinced of his Godhead and ministry. Often the convinced disciple loves God and his word but he is still the master of his life, and his attitude is self-centered. Often these disciples perceive themselves as the center of the body of Christ, and all aspects of the body must revolve around them. This group of disciples comprises the majority of Christianity. The committed disciple is the one who has allowed the Lord to transform his or her life and is a doer of the word, not a hearer only. The committed disciple loves God and his word and is the servant of the Lord, seeking to please him with his or her life. The attitude of the committed is a God-centered Christian experience filled with self-denial, 
They have become living sacrifices dedicated to God. During these months of quiet interlude, Jesus taught his disciples the key requirements that they would need in order to be his future apostles. The first requirement of Christian discipleship is to put family dynamics and peer pressure into proper order. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus taught that those who do not hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters could not be his disciples. This is not logical. Is Jesus condoning hatred of family? The answer to this question is no. The term hate cannot be understood as an emotional reaction. God doesn't condone despising of a family. But the concept of hate, in terms of Jewish custom, speaks of submission to authority. To hate family, according to Jewish custom, is to refuse to submit to their control over your life and decisions. According to the scripture, the Pharisees plotted to excommunicate anyone from the synagogue who confessed Jesus Christ openly. Therefore, anyone who yields to family pressure and refuses to acknowledge Christ could not be his disciple. Jesus realized that the attitude that would cause somebody to obey the will of family and friends more than the will of God is peer pressure. And this attitude loves the praises of men more than the praise of God. Only when we love God and His will more than social pressure and acceptance can the kingdom be formed in our hearts. Luke chapter 14 verse 27 And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. The second requirement of Christian discipleship is to bear our own cross. What did Jesus mean by this requirement? Did he require his disciples to die on wooden execution stakes? Let's examine the cross principle as recorded. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Jesus understood the true condition of the human heart and soul. He understood that his disciples must learn to deny themselves. Until they learn to deny their own will and lust, they frustrate the work of Christ in them. We must also learn to deny the control of the world, or we frustrate the formation of the kingdom in us also. The power of Christ's ministry is established in the fact that he did not seek his own will, but he sought to do the will of his Father. Before we can hope to fulfill the will of God in our lives, we must learn to deny our own self-will. The second condition of the cross principle is to do the will of God by following Jesus. According to Jesus, the cross we carry on a daily basis is the will of God for our lives. The way of Christ is a path of self-sacrifice and obedience to the revealed will of God. The reward of following the consecrated way is access into the holy presence of God. The will of God is simple. We are to obey Christ and His commandments. Only then do we experience the transforming power of the love of God. Jesus admonished the multitudes, 
that each disciple of His must take up His or her own cross on a daily basis and strive to obey God, not man. Luke chapter 14, verse 28 through 33. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? He is not able. He will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any one of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. The third requirement of Christian discipleship is to count the spiritual cost needed to become a disciple of Christ. Generic Christian thinking believes all aspects of Christian development are the gifts of God. The born-again experience is given freely through faith, but the deeper dimensions of God require the payment of a higher spiritual price. This price is the path of the cross. According to Jesus' teachings, the world mocks the person who attempts to become a true disciple but fails to finish the project because of the lack of commitment. Often we hear those who compromise with the world state, I tried Jesus once, but it wasn't for me. It just didn't take. We see in the life of the Apostle Paul this principle clearly brought to light. He was one who counted loss of all things in this world system, a small price to pay for the excellence of knowing Christ. In the eyes of Paul, he was crucified to this world, and this world was crucified to him. Luke chapter 14, verse 34 and 35. Salt is good. But if it loses its saltness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It's thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus at this point compared his disciples to salt and the importance of not losing their effectiveness. When a disciple loses their first love in Christ, they have lost their effectiveness as a witness for Christ, and in the eyes of Jesus, they are worthless servants. It is a sad thing to see when a disciple continually fails to apply the requirements of discipleship. They become double-minded in their service to God, and the Bible says they become unstable in all their ways. Jesus understood the high price that would be required of his disciples. Therefore, he spent several months chiseling these principles into their hearts. A lost and dying world needed the gospel of the kingdom. And this message must be carried by these simple blue-collar workers from the region of Galilee. Jesus deviated from his discipleship training to prepare for participation in the Passover of April 13th of 32 AD. He returned from the northeastern region of Palestine to the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Just before his departure to Jerusalem, Jesus went up to a mountain to teach the disciples, and a great multitude followed him. John chapter 6 Verse 5 through 15, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? 
He asked this question only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. After this miracle, the multitudes only sought Jesus because he satisfied their physical hunger. This self-centered need prompted the discourse on the true bread of life. Jesus also realized that the common folk who made up this crowd wanted to make him king of Israel, but this could not be. Jesus knew their hearts were still darkened by the Pharisaic doctrine taught in the synagogues that the Messiah would come as a physical king to deliver the nation of Israel from Rome. These verses indicate that Jesus withdrew from the crowd into a solitary mountain in order to pray. But when evening came, the disciples of Jesus went down to the lake where they set sail for the port of Capernaum. Jesus did not journey with them because he spent the evening in prayer alone on the mountain. Both John and Mark referenced this event, but Matthew went into greater detail. Therefore we turn to the Gospel of Matthew for the remainder of this incident. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 through 36. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and, beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gethsemane. And when the people of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. The next day when the crowds noticed that Jesus and his disciples left at night for the Capernaum region, they acquired boats and followed him. When the multitude found Jesus, he preached his famous Bread of Life sermon. John chapter 6, 
verse 26 through 27. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Christ admonished his hearers not to dedicate their lives in pursuit of physical wants and desires that will rot or rust. The goal of Christ was to instruct the multitudes of their need for spiritual meat more than their need for physical food. Since Christ desired to awaken a spiritual hunger for righteousness in them, only when we are spiritually hungry can we be spiritually fed. John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Upon hearing the admonishment of Christ, the multitudes questioned him as to what was required to do the works of God. The implication to their question is this, by what tradition or religious code do we adhere to to be part of Messiah's kingdom? Jesus answered that a man could do nothing to justify his righteousness through works of the law, but only through simple faith in his person could man become the workmanship of God. Man will never be justified before God by adherence to a legalistic religious code, but our justification can only come by faith in Jesus Christ. John chapter 6 verse 30 to 33. So they asked him, What miraculous sign then will you give that we may see and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. These verses reveal the main problem the Jews had in receiving the teachings and ministry of Christ. The Jews believed Moses gave them manna in the wilderness, and they placed their faith in Moses, not God. This trust in Moses, not God, was the root of the Pharisees' rejection of Christ. Jesus quickly rebuked his hearers for this error in their doctrine. God gave Israel manna, not Moses. He was only God's tool. Jesus used this discourse to expose the crowd to the truth about the true spiritual bread of God. The common Jewish belief was that the manna in the wilderness was the bread of God. But Jesus stated that manna was the bread sent from God, not the bread of God. John chapter 6, verse 35 through 40. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you, that ye also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
Christ clearly stated that he was the bread of God, the bread of life sent to humanity from heaven. And we eat the bread of God by believing in Jesus. The bread of God is designed to give eternal life unto the world. Manna could only nourish natural soulish life, but Christ came to give the eternal uncreated life of God. The character of God is life, and this life is channeled to the world through Jesus. The Bible teaches that God's life is designed to reveal the Father in us and through us to this lost and dying world. Christ stated that those who are his disciples would respond to his message and build their foundation in God, while the Jews who reject his message have their foundation in Moses. This false foundation frustrated God's ability to draw these people to Jesus. Christ at this point in his discourse became very controversial when he stated that the true bread of God is his flesh. John chapter 6 verse 51 to 58 I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eats of this bread he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eats my flesh, and drinks my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which comes down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eats of this bread shall live forever. Jesus taught that the sacrifice of his flesh would redeem the world because sin had robbed humanity of the life of God. This statement angered many of the Jews who heard Jesus. They didn't understand that he was the true Passover lamb who would be sacrificed for the sin of the world. What is the flesh of Christ? The flesh of Jesus is his total humanity. And to eat of his flesh is to believe in Jesus and trust in his redemptive work on the cross. John also taught that the word of God became flesh, and he who eats of the flesh of Christ eats of his word. The sad fact remains, most of the body of Christ understands the humanity of Christ from an assortment of theological positions but fail to enter the holy presence of God in intimate fellowship. The reason for this failure is simple. The consecrated way of Christ is the path of the cross. What is the blood of Christ? According to Genesis 9.4 and Leviticus 17.11, the blood is the life of the flesh and Jesus taught that his blood is our spiritual drink. However, in reference to Christ, the blood is the life of the flesh. But in reference to God, this life is his spirit. The blood of Christ in reference to his Godhead is his deity. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 instructs us that the blood of Christ is designed to purge our inner heart from dead works of the flesh and form us into the servants of Christ. It should be obvious that the blood of Christ is alive and living in us, performing the will of God. 
During the Last Supper celebration, Jesus blessed the bread and wine and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. During this solemn feast, Christ instituted the communion sacrament for his church as a perpetual reminder of his New Testament covenant. And this spiritual reality finds its root in John chapter 6, verse 32 through 58. These verses record four promises we have in Christ should we eat and drink of him. The communion sacrament we see in churches today is to remind us of Christ and his covenant promises and our Christian responsibilities to his New Testament covenant. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat of Christ have the promise of His life dwelling in them. We are possessed with the mind of the Spirit that is filled with unconditional peace and is not dependent on circumstances. But it's our choice to allow the peace of God to calm our savage beast. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Those who eat of Christ have the promise that he will raise them up on the last day. Our eternity is secure in Christ. There is no need to fear physical death, because Christ will raise us from the dead. When we partake of communion, we acknowledge before God our faith in our eventual resurrection. Take hope in this truth, because it is true. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. Those who eat of Christ have the promise that he will dwell in them and they in him. According to scripture, the complete Godhead tabernacles in those who have Christ and the character of Jesus is to become our character. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. Those who eat of Christ have the promise and responsibility to live by him and fulfill his will in their lives. To live in context to this scripture means to be motivated, controlled, and submitted to the life force of Christ within us. As Christ obeyed his Father, he was empowered by him to do his will. Even so must we, who eat of Christ, obey him. A proper Christian attitude is to realize that we are not our own. We cannot live our lives as we like, for we are bought with a price. Therefore, those who eat of Christ must live by him. Should we seek only to obey our self-will, we are in rebellion. The sad fact remains, the majority of Christians partake of the Lord's Supper, ignorant of its reality and the Christian responsibility associated with it. After the Bread of Life discourse, many of Christ's disciples questioned him. John chapter 6, verse 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? The reasons the teachings of Christ were hard to understand is revealed in verse 63. It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The great religious teachers of the world instructed their disciples 
in a humanistic code of conduct. But the design of Christ was to form the kingdom and his disciples, to have them be a spiritual expression of him. The words that Jesus taught could only be understood by revelation of the Spirit of God. And this is the reason why many of Jesus' disciples were offended by his teachings. Their foundation was being challenged. The disciple whose foundation is in God will respond to the message of Christ, as Peter did during this discourse. John chapter 6, verse 68 and 69. And then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Jewish religious people, whose foundation was the doctrine of man, rejected the message of Christ. No doubt the teachings of Jesus were designed to separate the sheep from the goats among his disciples. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Imagine being a pastor and preaching a message that causes nearly your entire congregation to walk out in disgust and disillusionment. It's important to understand that we can only be disillusioned when we have an illusion in the first place. What is an illusion? An illusion is an idea or belief that is false and deluded. Is it possible that Christians could believe in a Jesus filled with theological illusion? We filter our understanding of Jesus through denominational rhetoric. What is our motive for serving Jesus Christ? To the crowds that followed Jesus, their motive was to have him meet their self-centered physical needs. But to the true disciples of Jesus, he only had the words of eternal life. Jesus did not fit into the Pharisee religious box of his day. He was revolutionary and controversial, and he sought to reproduce his revolutionary demeanor into his disciples. The Pharisees and the Sadducees created a theological box to put their illusion of righteousness into, but Jesus did not fit into their box. We wag our heads at the legalism used by these sanctimonious religious leaders to control their people. But are we any different? We all create boxes that we use to judge our brothers and sisters in Christ. And usually our boxes are replicas of larger boxes created by denominational rhetoric. A walk through church history clearly shows that the great revivals of God all occurred outside the box erected by static church liturgy. The Apostle Paul looked outside the Jewish box to see a Gentile revival that would sweep the world. Men like John Wesley, Martin Luther, or John Calvin also looked outside the box of Roman Catholicism and the papacy to see a church ablaze with the truth of Scripture. Even to the late 20th century, the men who ushered in the charismatic renewal looked outside the boxes of Protestantism and Pentecostalism to see the Holy Spirit bring renewal to mundane mainline denominations, even Roman Catholicism. Ask yourself this one question. Would the Jesus of the Gospels fit into your box today? How you honestly answer this question speaks a lot about the insight you have into the box you have created. It's so important to understand that Jesus did not come to give us a religion about God. He came to give us a relationship with God.